Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. My name is Liam and according to this here coffee thing, I drank some dark matter this morning. Uh, surely that cannot be good for you. Scientists, let me know in the comments if you could. But today we're here to talk about some key differences between the anime and the manga, although not in our typical way. I'm not interested in issues like art, pacing, and animation, and that sort of stuff, we've done that to death. Instead, what I want to focus on are core aspects that the anime changed from the manga, regardless of any adaptation issues. And many of these changes will have decent reasoning behind them, such as censorship. Because for whatever reason, you can get away with a lot more of, uh, well, everything in manga than you can in anime. But there are also changes between the two mediums that are kind of puzzling, and I can offer no explanation for how they really happened, only that they happened. And then there's also some that put a really twisted perspective on certain beloved characters. For example, there is a Sanji change in here that made me go, whoa, that is, uh, wow, Sanji, that is not cool. Stop that at once. Which we will get to, but it's all going to begin with a quick round of why was that dog censored? A very simple mini game, the rules of which are as follows. Here we find three dogs of One Piece. Two of these adorable pooches have had to be censored in the anime for some reason, but it is going to be your job to guess which dog was not censored. Now, should you guess incorrectly, then your punishment will be to subscribe to the Grand Line Review, thus resulting in consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your dinner bowl. And if you are correct, you will have to pat all three dogs until they say stop, which will be never. So which doggo will it be? Holy, Soro, or the lovable Choo Choo? Make your choice now and we shall reveal the answer in three, two, one, and bam, it was Holy, who used his divine doggo skills to escape any form of censorship in the anime. So if you guessed incorrectly, then you know the thing to do and please do say hi in the comments below if you are a new member of the Grand Fleet. Welcome. Of course, that does mean that Choo Choo and Soro did have changes made to them and one of them was a bit more extreme than the other. In terms of Choo Choo, there's a scene in chapter 12 of the manga where Luffy pokes him in the eyes because he isn't sure if Choo Choo is real and even if he is real, whether or not he's alive or dead. Either way, it looks like it hurts and Choo Choo responds rather appropriately by biting Luffy's rubber face thing. Now I imagine that Toei did not want to promote poking various dogs in the eyes, so instead they had Luffy target Choo Choo's head. And while Zoro may still look shocked at the results, he's not one to judge because in the case of Zoro, who is, I've just realized is shockingly close to being named Zoro, but in the case of Zoro, Zoro actually killed Helmeppo's prized wolf in the manga with his ever so sharp sword blades. The anime, however, did once again see the potential problem with animal cruelty here, and instead they had Zoro throw a stool at him, which is still bad, but it was a fairly rabid wolf, so yeah, <laughs> gets stooled, I guess. Violence in general is a big part of what gets changed from medium to medium though, and certainly not just with animals, unless you count humans as animals, which well, maybe we should, because sometimes my YouTube comment section does resemble something of a zoo. But in the next case, I would like to examine the very famous white bearded incident, which has nothing to do with a beard, but everything to do with a mustache. But during his last moments of glory at Marineford, Whitebeard took what I can only describe as a bit of an owie against Admiral Akainu, who managed to blow a good chunk of his head just uh, right off, right, right off. It's gone now. It's, I don't, where did that bit of head end up? But to this day, this is still one of my most vividly memorable manga panels, because as soon as I saw that happen, I thought to myself, there is no hope for this man's survival. That's it. We are witnessing the last moments of his life right here and now. So I was very, very curious as to how the anime was going to handle such a brutal moment. But in their defense, this is a pretty difficult thing to put on Sunday morning television. So instead they rather hilariously had Akainu blow off part of his mustache, which uh, no, it doesn't quite hold the same weight to it. But once again, it is hard to blame them. I really don't know what more they could have done, but I do find it a little bit hilarious that this is moment of, you know, like peak drama and it just results in a, in a bit of hair removal. So Akainu is basically just a glorified tube of nads. Taking a small detour away from violence, don't worry, there will be more, but I would now like to talk about fingers. At heart, I think we all know that Echiro Oda is a child. He has wild imagination, enjoys a crude sense of humor, and as such, he often depicts his own characters, giving a bit of an up yours whenever the situation calls for it. Famous examples of this would be Trafalgar Law, who has used the middle finger of doom both pre and post time skip. And apart from not liking bread, it's quite possibly his most well-pronounced character trait. Meanwhile, Charlotte Pudding was not above activating this attack either, nor was Sai on Dress Rosa, and many, many, many more. Characters just do it every time Oda needs to express some sort of immature anger. And of course, such profane gesturing is not at all tolerated within the anime, who frequently need to change the finger in question to another, far less meaningful appendage. And even our straw hats are not immune from this treatment because Sanji, a man who generally 
merely reserves his hands for cooking, unleashed this unruly meat stick upon the Okama who graciously brought him to Sabadi. And I'd also like to note that my Word document autocorrected Okama to Obama. And while I do find that admittedly rather humorous, I don't want to spread misinformation about Sanji flipping off former world leaders. As for Sanji, I alluded earlier that there is an intriguing change regarding him. One that makes you, or at least makes me, see the character in a slightly less noble light. And this happens during the initial Sabadi arc. You may or may not, and let's be honest, it's probably more than likely not, remember a character named Pasha. She was a slave being sold at the human auction house and a dancer, I believe. And when Sanji, Nami, and Chopper arrive at the auction house to try and win Kami, Pasha is presented on stage and then Sanji asks if they can buy her as well. It's a clear play on Sanji's basic perverted comedy scheme, albeit in a rather dark context. Slavery is not exactly a light issue. And here Sanji would appear to be putting the concerns of his sous chef, which I'm using as a euphemism for his penis, ahead of the concerns for basic human life. And the anime did realize this because they changed Sanji's dialogue quite significantly. And so instead of becoming a drooling oaf, he expresses pure fury at the concept of people treating a lady in this way. He also does not ask to buy her, so he comes off as significantly more noble in the anime incarnation. Although the weird duality of Sanji's character is that both portrayals do make sense. He heavily objectifies and obsesses over the mere sight of any woman or woman related thing, but he does also have a strong code of chivalry, so I really could see him doing either. I just find it interesting that the anime writers thought to themselves, eh, maybe we should you know, not have one of our major heroes make light of such a serious issue, just maybe. And Sanji, uh, this man, he's actually been subject to quite a few changes during the lifespan of the anime. And fun fact, in chapter 68, it is revealed why Sanji started smoking. He did it so that he could become more of an adult or in his own words, become a man. And even though Japan is a lot more lax on smoking in media, they still recognized it as probably not the greatest of ideas to show a 10 year old smoking and not only smoking, but doing it for positive character development reasons. So this scene is omitted entirely. And I suppose according to anime canon, Sanji began smoking at the age of 20, which is the legal age in Japan, except, oh no, Sanji's only 19 years old when we start the series. Huh. Well, that's a thing. Now, at the risk of this video becoming very Sanji-centric, he does have more changes surrounding him, and the next one is not exactly his fault. On Thriller Bark, there is a scene, a scene featuring Absalom, which is already kind of red flaggy enough. But in a grand moment of One Piece manga brutality, Sanji gets, he gets pretty ridiculously stabbed. He's like, look at this. We are talking all of the way through. I can see both sides of the knife, and that's how you know it, uh, it really hurts. And the heroic idea is that he throws Nami out of the way because he doesn't want to stain her white dress, which she was forced into whilst unconscious, with his red blood goop. And I suppose that is kind of sweet in his own weird Sanji way. Look, he's definitely uh, like, I don't know, how do we put this? Like you know, the lesser of the two perverts in this conflict. And in the anime, Sanji does still get stabbed. However, the knife does not penetrate his chest and the blood is somewhat lessened, which is interesting because I still feel like the action is every bit as violent, even if the knife doesn't go as far. But I suppose it's more about eliminating that unnecessary goriness because the scene works just as well with how the anime did it, in my opinion. Now from stabbing in the back to swirling on the chest, here we have Miss Wednesday as her outfit is presented in the anime. She dons a nice sort of dual stripy top. It's quite fashionable, really. And now I'm going to show you what this top looks like in the manga. And just a warning, if you look too closely, you may get hypnotized because we now have what I can only describe as a swirly, breasty, effecty. And I think the reasoning for the changes here were fairly obvious. And I have seen people argue that this was kind of unnecessary because other shonen series, also including One Piece itself actually, get away with doing a hell of a lot more than this. And that's true, but what Oda did here was he sort of broke the golden rule of manga breastery, which is that all of the swirls ultimately culminate in the illusion of nipples. And nipples are historically the only place that shonen anime does really draw a line in this area. So the anime did change it, although in both movie two and movie eight, Miss Wednesday does make an appearance and they very sneakily use her original outfit design. Although I'm assuming they can do that because there's a very different standard about theatrical release versus a televised broadcast. It's not just nipple illusions that can cause problems though, which is a sentence I never thought I'd be saying, but sometimes general breastosity can also be pushed a bit too far even for Japanese morning television. And our prime example of this is Marguerite during Amazon Lily. There's the rather famous part of the arc where she and Sweet Pea mistake Luffy's man bits for a disgusting mushroom growth. But in the manga, Marguerite is actually bathing Luffy topless. 
Whereas in the anime, she is still quite clad on her upper area. And this one is quite funny because I've seen someone anecdotally argue that the anime should have remained faithful to the manga because it makes sense, so much sense for her to be topless whilst bathing. Which I, I guess sure, but if we're bathing, then why did she feel the need to keep her skirt on and why does Sweet Pea keep her top on? There is no logic to be had here. Well, no logic beyond the fact that Oda I just wanted a bit of tip. Going in the complete opposite direction now, we're going to tackle one of my favorites. This is probably one of the biggest changes from the manga to the anime and one that I still get questions about almost on a daily basis. And it all has to do with Zeph's leg. So if you're an anime only fan watching this firstly, hello, it's nice to see you. I do hope you're enjoying Wano, but you probably recall this event a little bit differently to the manga readers because in the anime, Zeph's leg got caught while he was swimming to save Sanji from drowning. And I suppose at that point, let's be real, he also had to save himself from drowning. So he made the choice to cast it aside for the betterment of the future, both Sanji's and his. And that's cool. But in contrast to that, in the manga, Zeph did manage to keep his leg a little bit longer. In fact, it was with him while he was stranded with Sanji until Zeph came to a moment of pure desperation. And as both sides know, Zeph quite selflessly gave all of the food he had to Sanji, but that did not stop Zeph's stomach from a rumbling. So manga Zeph decided that the only solution to this was to smash his leg off with a jagged rock and eat it in order to survive. It is probably one of the most brutal drawings ever put to page in One Piece and something that still makes me flinch when I look at it or even think about it to this day. So it was deemed a bit too violent by Toei and Zeph's story was slightly altered. And I've met a lot of people who hate this choice. I've also met many who love it. The anime defenders will say that this was a stupid, stupid move from Zeph because the rapid blood loss and general trauma would negate the nutritious benefits of eating one's own leg. And then there are the manga defenders who say, well, the blood loss and trauma would have happened regardless because Zeph lost his leg in the water anyway. If anything, the anime's events are even more unbelievable because Zeph survived for even longer with his gaping, gaping wound. And after all this time, I have to say I'm still much more on team manga. I like that Zeph made the choice to sacrifice his leg rather than having it caught in an accident. Because like I said, just forget Sanji. In the anime, it was either Zeph removes his leg or he drowns to death. The choice was basically made for him. Whereas in the manga, it has an almost saw-like quality about it where we have to watch this man come to a truly heartbreaking decision and that just gets to me a bit more. Entirely subjective though, and either way, it, it still makes no logical sense from any kind of survival standpoint, so yeah. For something that does make some sense though, hopefully do check out this video where we rank every Vice Admiral in One Piece. Lots of garpy goodness to be had there, so I look forward to seeing you there. Did I really just say there twice in that one sentence? Oh, I should not have done that, but I'm not re-recording it, so I'll see you there, whatever.